Welcome everybody uh, and thank you for joining us to remember and celebrate one of the most important and influential jurists in the history of our Commonwealth, Chief Justice Ralph Gantz. Um, let me start by thanking Professors Minow and Wilkins for gathering these distinguished speakers today to share their reflections and to pay tribute to Chief Justice Gantz. We're honored to be joined today by members of his family, including Professor Deborah Ramirez and Rachel, Michael, and Fred Gantz. We're also grateful to have so many of Chief Justice Gantz's friends, classmates, and colleagues from the Supreme Judicial Court and the judiciary more broadly. Chief Justice Gantz led a life of great purpose and meaning. Born in New York, he attended both Harvard College and Harvard Law School, where he was notes editor on the Harvard Law Review. He went on to work as a special assistant to the FBI director before being appointed assistant US attorney for the District of Massachusetts, where he led the public corruption division. He then spent several years in private practice before being appointed to the Massachusetts Superior Court. And then in 2008, Governor Deval Patrick appointed Judge Gantz to the SJC, and then six years later elevated him to Chief Justice. Others will talk in greater detail about Chief Justice Gantz's contributions. I just wanted to say what a great Chief Justice he was, one of the greatest. He was a wise, careful, and learned judge whose decisions combined a real world sensibility with a deep sense of principle and rigor. He was a judge's judge. He was also a highly impactful Chief Justice. He reached out to communities to learn how they were touched and affected by our legal system. Not content to accept the status quo, he was also a great law reformer, working, for example, to eliminate a destructive and unfair system of mandatory minimum sentences and to reform practices surrounding eyewitness identification. He also worked tirelessly to make the bar of the Commonwealth more diverse, more inclusive, and more humane. And surely one of his greatest legacies lies in the many ways in which he sought over the decades both to understand and to remove barriers to justice, particularly those preventing vulnerable and marginalized people from getting the representation they need to vindicate their rights under law. Just days before his passing, Chief Justice Gantz received a report that he commissioned from HLS's Criminal Justice Policy Program. That report has cast important light on the gross racial disparities in the imposition of criminal punishment in Massachusetts, a level of disparity far worse than the average in the nation at large. This report, which we hope and expect will serve as the foundation for criminal law reform in the Commonwealth, was emblematic of a lifetime of efforts by Chief Justice Gantz to promote equal justice under law. Beyond his achievements as a jurist, all who knew him well remember his deep kindness and decency as a human being, as well as his sense of humor and unaffected humility, qualities that he also brought to his work. Chief Justice Gantz will go down in history not only as a wise judge, but also as someone who made our legal system and our profession fairer, more equitable, and more compassionate. His passing is a loss for the justice system, for the commonwealth, and for all who care about humanizing the law. We are proud that Chief Justice Gantz was a member of our community. He was a distinguished and beloved alumnus and a lifelong friend of his alma mater. We are grateful for his vision and his inspiration. He was a living example of what lawyers and the law can do to make our world better. We at Harvard Law School will always cherish our friendship with Chief Justice Gantz and be grateful for his contributions and for his example. May his memory be a blessing. It's now my honor to turn the proceedings over to my colleague, Martha Minow, the 300th anniversary university professor at Harvard. She will introduce our distinguished panel and moderate today's program. Thank you, Professor Minow. Thank you, Dean Manning. President John F. Kennedy once said, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. 
Chief Justice Ralph Gantz made a difference every day of his life. Brilliant, wise, courageous as a justice, as a judge and a lawyer, spectacular as a leader, a friend and a family member, outstanding from his days as a student, Harvard College, Harvard Law School, in practice and teaching and law reform, he made all the difference in his own work, advancing justice and in his guidance and inspiration for others. Truly a national leader in access to justice and in criminal justice reform. Chief Justice Gantz during the pandemic showed what real leadership is. Exemplary responsiveness, nimbleness in devising ways to ensure legal protections and assistance, uh, dealing with emergencies, housing, domestic violence and all ongoing matters. His constant efforts to make equal justice for all a reality stand as a lesson. He used law to repair the world, to straighten out what's distorted, to set out order, to fix what's broken, whether in boldly opening up court records and resources to examine and overcome racial bias and judicial action, or in approving, improving legal education and paths to public service. His genius in making the courthouse itself and the judiciary places trusted by and open to communities for learning. A human being of thorough integrity, Chief Justice Gantz provided a beacon of decency and strength inside the judiciary and in his dealings with everyone he encountered. I was so lucky to work alongside him and I mourn the loss of a truly magnificent human being with an unshakable force for justice, truth and goodness. His utter devotion to his remarkable wife, Professor Deborah Ramirez, his son, Michael, his daughter, Rachel, his brother, Fred, what a gift he was to them, to his friends, to the Commonwealth, indeed to the very idea and ideal of justice. How true to all that he cared about that the Gantz Ramirez family has created the Ralph D. Gantz Access to Justice Fund in the chief's honor. Let me point you to the site online at themassbar.org under Grants Fund. This will support initiatives to advance access to justice, racial equity, and criminal justice reform in the legal system. And it's a collaboration between the Ralph D. Gantz Access to Justice Fund Advisory Committee, the Massachusetts Bar Association, and the Massachusetts Bar Foundation. The fund will seek to carry on his legacy on the issues he cared most about and the donations are of course welcome. Further events at Harvard Law School in honor of Just Chief Justice Gantz will include this Thursday, a session on eradicating racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Professor Wilkins will tell more about an upcoming event. And in the spring, we will have an event addressing issues in housing with local advocates led by Professor Esme Caramello. Now it wouldn't be true to my friend Ralph to be without a touch of humor. So to any who are feeling too daunted by his extraordinary example to try to follow in his footsteps, just remember what the Dalai Lama said, if you think you are too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. Ralph Gantz devoted his life to pursuing a more just society and we honor him by remembering him and leaning into that same mission. We're joined by many people who knew him well, some 80 from the Supreme Judicial Court alone and people who admired him from afar. And many others who are unable to join him have let us know how much he meant to, him, to them. Our colleague, Jim Greiner, who founded the Harvard Law School Access to Justice Lab shared these remarks, and I'll be brief with them. Most people know that Chief Justice Gantz was a nationally recognized leader in access to justice and in the search for solutions to racial inequities in the justice system. Equally impressive was his willingness to do the right thing even when it was unpopular. For example, many despise his attempts to address racial problems in the courts in part through data and analysis. There were those who believed that the time for careful consideration and analysis had passed and there were those who believed that there was no problem to solve. Chief Justice Gantz recognized that careful thinking didn't and shouldn't mean inaction. 
He recognized that problems can exist even if some people can't see them. Similarly, Chief Justice Gantz understood that like any institution of government, the court system exists to serve the people, not to preside over them. He understood that if the court system failed to serve the people, it failed. And he lived what he understood. Courage and wisdom may come in many forms. Ralph Gantz displayed them all. Thank you, Jim, for those comments. The people who will speak today are among the many who want to remember Ralph Gantz. And I, they've all asked me to keep the introduction short, and so I will. We'll start with uh, Governor Deval Patrick, who actually um, led the Commonwealth to excellence in so many fields, and one of them is the judiciary. And his nomination of Ralph Gantz to serve on the court uh, is no small part of his own legacy. He will be followed by Chief Justice Margaret Marshall, formerly of the Supreme Judicial Court, and his colleague and friend and leader of the bar in higher education. Then Massachusetts District Attorney Rachel Rollins, gutsy leader of law reform. And then my colleague David Wilkins, Lester Kissel Professor of Law, founder of the Law School Legal Profession Center for Lawyers and classmate and friend. Then Susan Finnegan, national leader of pro bono and public interest legal service, co-chair of the Massachusetts Commission on Access to Justice. And then remarks by Justice Kimberly Budd, colleague of Chief Justice Gantz, also originally nominated by Governor Patrick. And finally, remarks by Professor Deborah Ramirez, Northeastern University School of Law professor and beloved wife of Chief Justice Gantz. Now, Professor Patrick, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Martha. Uh, to, to Deborah, Rachel, Michael, Fred, and the Gantz and Ramirez families, to Dean Manning, to you, Professor Minow, and the Harvard Law School family who have convened us today, to the honorable members of the judiciary, to the elected officials and other distinguished guests, and to the hundreds of friends, fighters for justice, and fellow mourners who have joined in today's remembrance. I thank you for giving me just a minute to share my own present sadness in losing Ralph too soon, and my lasting joy in knowing him all. You've all heard that famous comment from one of the members of the Governor's Council upon learning of my nomination of Ralph Gantz to the SJC. She said, Ralph Gantz is a mensch and the court needs a mensch. I love that. What I thought the court needed was someone who knew how cases are actually tried, who knew what it was like to review evidence and credibility, what the human dynamics of a courtroom are and how they affect or influence outcomes. I wanted someone who would see and hear and seek to understand the vulnerable, whether he or she was the litigant or witness, unfamiliar or even a little intimidated by the surroundings, the language and the customs of a courtroom, or the nervous, awkward, and inexperienced counsel. We have the great good fortune of having a wealth of legal talent in the Commonwealth generally and on our SJC in particular. But I wanted someone who would guide the court to opinions that were actually instructive to lower, lower courts and lawyers in plain language. I was looking for that. But I didn't realize I had a uh, I didn't realize I had a chance to get a mensch until I met Ralph. This is um, near the end of an arduous vetting process after the Judicial Nominating Commission, the Joint Bar Committee, and the Governor's Legal Council have all grilled the candidate and made their recommendation, an argument for why uh, th this candidate fit the internal objectives I'd set. When we sat together, we talked about being a judge, about being an appellate judge, about the discipline and uh, restraint required to apply the law uh, fairly to the facts. But we also talked about real life, about real people who in every case are in court at all because every other institution of our society has failed them. 
about how a judge could never expect to fix every injustice, but to do justice in the matter before him or her. That's when I knew I had a chance to appoint a mensch. For a long time now, it seems to me, American jurisprudence has been on a course of reasoning justice right out of the law, civil and voting rights, in cases where we could choose to elevate or subordinate human dignity or limit the intrusion of the state into intimate personal decisions time after time over the years, the American judiciary has stacked up precedent in favor of power and privilege. The mighty are affirmed and the meek are left back. The law and the courts cannot always fix that, but knowing that they are the last resort courts can resolve to give everyone a fair chance. That was Justice Gantz, as a judge and as a person. His insistence on seeking the meek and hearing the frightened and the outcast was his way of bringing justice back into the courts and into the world. His accomplishments speak to that. His emphasis on reforming minimum mandatory sentencing, on addressing the rental crisis, on rooting structural racism out of the ju judicial system, all speak to that. And you will hear today, without doubt from others who will tell you about the many personal and private examples of that same instinct, that same menschiness. Brian Stevenson is one of the best observers of the remarkable character of America. He has written and spoken about how our founding ideals of equality, opportunity, and fair play, civic aspirations are the source of our greatness. And that's why he wrote that in America, the, op the opposite of poverty is not wealth, it's justice. That's the example Ralph gave us. I was honored to have elevated him to the job that suited that mission and his own person perfectly. I hope and pray that we honor that legacy with the most fitting tribute of all by living it. Now it's my great honor to welcome our next speaker, the legendary former Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court, Margaret Marshall. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Patrick. From one end of the Commonwealth to the other, from West Stockbridge to Boston, on both sides of the highway traveling west and traveling east, the highway signs blink at thousands of passing vehicles. Need help with rent? Call 211. East and west from one end of the Commonwealth, to the other. As I traveled that highway this week, it was as if the chief were waving from above, do not grieve, the work continues. Ralph Gantz, how to describe him, brilliant, yes, consummate writer of judicial opinions. This is what he said after he had served on the Supreme Judicial Court for one year as an associate justice. There is, he said, a great deal of craft involved in seeking to write opinions, both to address the legal issue that is before us, to attempt to provide language that is going to be clear enough that it can be followed, sensible enough that it will work in practice, and that will avoid setting forth careless language that will pose a problem that we may not anticipate or need to address in the decisions. He was a consummate writer of judicial opinions, teacher. He taught at three law schools. He gave up teaching law students, but he never gave up teaching. His opinions are textbook examples of making sure that they were clear enough to the litigants, other judges, and the public, and he taught. He taught through those opinions. As Chief Justice, I know, I never, of course, served with him as a Chief Justice, but I know that he was admired by his six colleagues, whoever they were at any time, viewed as an intellectual giant in each case. Discussions at the Justice's monthly conference were lengthy. Each case was carefully considered. 
the opinions were carefully crafted and under his leadership, the opinions of the court continue to be widely respected across this country. Those opinions count. Access to justice, in his first year as an associate justice, I asked him if he would co-chair the then new Access to Justice Commission that I had established. This is how Ralph described his response to my request. The first thing I said was that I was happy to do this work, but I wanted to make sure that at the end of my tenure, there were accomplishments of which we can say we were an important part. No grandstanding, just make sure that there are tangible accomplishments to which he could point to say we were an important part of this. The tangible results, too many to mention, but remember those blinking lights from one end of the Commonwealth to the other. And yes, a leader to follow. In January of this year, he was talking to a large audience of bar uh, of lawyers and others who had gathered at the State House, who had gathered at the State House to talk to the legislators about providing additional funding for access to justice. When you speak this afternoon to legislators and staff, he said, you speak not for yourselves, but for all those who have neither money nor power, but who might have the law on their side, if only they knew how to use it. Feel their hand on your shoulder, speak their truth. Feel their hand on your shoulder, speak their truth. Our nation is facing some of the greatest challenges of its history. And how can we honor the legacy of a great man, a man of intelligence, kindness, integrity, and commitment to upholding the law? Feel their hand on your shoulder, the hands of those who have neither money nor power. Ralph D. Gantz, blessed be his name, may he now rest in peace. It is now my great honor to turn this over to District Attorney Rachel Rollins from Suffolk County, District Attorney. Thank you so much, Chief. Good afternoon, it is my profound honor to have been invited to celebrate the life and legacy of a man of such uncommon decency vision and energy. Before I knew him in his official capacity as Chief Justice Gantz, I knew him as the devoted and loving husband of my mentor, friend, and brilliant law professor, Debbie Ramirez. Debbie, when I think of him, I think not first of an imposing legal mind in a black robe. No, I think of him as your beloved, your confidant, your best friend. I think of how beautiful you were with one another how you supported each other personally and professionally, and how fiercely you cheered each other on. Now, as I see you taking on alone the projects and commitments that were based on ideals you both shared, my heart breaks, but my heart is also full with this vision of what love and mutual respect in life and beyond looks like. Of course, I speak here today not just as a friend of Debbie's and a dear admirer of the Chief Justice, but also as the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of Suffolk County. Suffolk County includes Boston, Chelsea, Winthrop, and Revere. In the Commonwealth, Suffolk County residents experience the disproportionate share of violent crime, trauma, environmental pollution, negative me medical outcomes like COVID-19 outcomes, housing and food insecurity and other systemic harms that are statistically more likely to impact poor, black, brown and immigrant communities. The neighborhoods my office serves encompass the very ones that the Chief Justice was laser focused on helping. During his tenure, he was fearless in his commitment to ensuring that the system was just for all not only those with wealth, power, and privilege. He refused to see the law as something abstract, remote, or inevitable. He knew its power. 
its power to destroy, and its power to rebuild. He worked every day to ensure that this power was wielded with responsibility, thoughtfulness, and fairness, that its arc always bended toward equity, justice, and inclusion. There is no doubt that the Chief Justice and I led differently. He was measured, soft-spoken, and careful. I, well, you know, we just, we just led differently. But however differently we communicated or presented, our commitment and urgency was shared. No one knows this up till now, but I, I actually got one of my better retorts from the Chief Justice. In my first year in office, one of my fellow elected district attorneys wrote an op-ed dismissing me as a social justice district attorney. It was actually Chief Justice Gantz who quietly quipped back at me with his characteristic soft good humor. Is the opposite of that a social injustice, DA? which of course became my lead in social media. Chief Justice Gantz never feared being labeled a social justice chief justice because he knew that if you weren't actively working to pursue social justice, you were actively working to maintain social injustice. One manifestation of this is his commissioning of a report on racial disparities in the Massachusetts criminal system by the criminal justice policy program here at the law school at Harvard. Those of you who do not work in the state criminal legal system may not understand the bravery and audacity of this act. Usually when a leader reacts to an issue by commissioning a report, that is code for um, let's do something that makes it look like we're doing something without actually ever doing something. The commission of this report, however, is anything but that. The commissioning of this report meant breaking literal and metaphorical walls when others in power made excuses, hid the ball, or kept data locked behind firewalls and public records exceptions. Our chief said, absolutely not. He flung open the doors to the state's databases and let the light come flooding in. He wanted to see it all, no matter how bad or ugly it was, he wanted to know. The chief understood so well that you cannot change what you don't measure. He understood you cannot change what you don't reckon with. And if we don't quantify and make visible the devastating inequities in the system, we will continue to perpetuate them. And it is the most vulnerable amongst us who will lose their sense of self, their health, their liberty, and even potentially their lives. Our most impacted communities have been calling out for years for the Commonwealth's most powerful people and institutions to identify and remedy the significant racial disparities in the criminal legal system, yet they have been met with little urgency or movement in response. Chief Justice Gantz, however, felt that urgency. On matters of unfairness and injustice, he acted with a righteous fury, as if he and his loved ones were the ones being impacted. Indeed, he was the embodiment of what an ally is, or what I now choose to say instead of using the word ally, he was acting as if he were an unindicted co-conspirator. He received no personal gain from doing what was right in speaking out against systemic racism and wealth disparities, but he did it anyways, because he knew it was right, he knew it was just, and he knew it was honorable. He always worked to help and include, to educate and elevate and to mend and amend. And now that he is gone, it is on us to take on the mantle of his work. The brave act of commissioning the study on racial disparities must now be met with the brave act of reckoning with its results. For those of us in law and law enforcement, we must look deep into our role, both in the past and going forward. For those of us in governance, we must think about how to continue gathering, analyzing, and sharing data so that we may measure whether our efforts to redress are in fact making any difference at all. In life, the Chief Justice extended blessings to those he encountered, whether through his companionship or through his work. We honor our Chief Justice's memory through acts large and small that allow us to extend blessings to those we encounter. His memory is a blessing and his work is not finished. We who remain are here to continue it. And I, for one, will. Thank you. It is now my honor to introduce you to Professor David Wilkins. Thank you so much, District Attorney Rollins. Ralph 
Dreyfus Gans. I've always been fascinated by names. Given at birth, they both look backward to history and ahead to a hope for future. This is often particularly true about middle names, which are often specifically given to commemorate the mother's family legacy, which in our male dominated culture is often submerged in the tradition that children take their father's family name. When I read his obituary in the Boston Globe, I learned for the first time that this was true of Ralph too, whose his middle name was Dreyfus. I discovered, I only knew the D, which was his mother's maiden name. And like so many other things about Ralph, it immediately struck me as the perfect bridge between past, present, and future. I don't know whether there's any direct relation but the name Dreyfus is of course most famously linked to Alfred Dreyfus, the Jewish French military officer falsely accused of treason at the turn of the 20th century. L'affaire Dreyfus has become an infamous symbol of anti-Semitism and injustice. How appropriate that a man who carried this name would become the first Jewish chief justice in the history of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and a champion for justice for all. Others have and will talk about this part of his life far more eloquently than I. And as Martha indicated, I'll have the opportunity to talk about Ralph's visionary leadership in shaping the future of justice when we award him the Center on the Legal Professions Award for Professional Excellence in November at our upcoming symposium on remote courts and the future of justice. Suffice it to say, that since I first met Ralph in the editor's room at the Harvard Law Review, he has consistently been, to borrow Martin Luther King's apt description, a drum major for justice, always choosing public service over private gain and putting his talents in the service of the vulnerable and oppressed. But as anyone knows who knew him will attest, Ralph's proudest achievement in this area was passing this passion on to the next generation. A legacy once again captured in a middle name. Now I knew Ralph was brilliant from our first conversation in that editor's room in 1978, but it wasn't until he married Debbie Ramirez 10 years later that I also knew he was cool. You see, Debbie was a year behind us at HLS and I remember her clearly as the brilliant, beautiful firebrand president of what was then called the Chicano Law Students Association. And when I found out that Ralph and Debbie were getting married shortly after I came back to teach in 1986, I said there must be even more to my old friend Ralph Gantz than I thought. But of course, when I thought about it, the union made perfect sense. Debbie has always been a drum major for justice, quickly establishing herself in, at Northeastern as a leader in the fight for racial and social justice in policing and education and access to justice. And as Ralph and Debbie welcomed their two beautiful children, Michael and Rachel into the world, they made sure that each would carry their mother's deep commitment to social justice along with their fathers by giving them both the middle name Ramirez. In their young lives, Michael Ramirez Gantz and Rachel Ramirez Gantz have already shown that they are worthy carriers of this dual heritage. While still in college, Michael created JusticeServe, an innovative tech startup to improve access to justice for the millions of low and moderate income individuals who cannot afford a lawyer to protect their basic rights. And during her time at HLS, Rachel Ramirez Gantz devoted hundreds of hours to the Tenant Advocacy Project, protecting vulnerable populations from eviction. Yes, the future of the Ramirez Gantz legacy is clearly in good hands. But as I have had the privilege of watching Michael and Rachel grow from precocious and inquisitive children into accomplished young adults, I can't help but think of one more person who shares Ralph's middle name. 
the actor Richard Dreyfus. Although spelled with two S's instead of one, Ralph and Richard have some striking similarities. There is, of course, their devilish good looks. Although Ralph would want me to be clear that he towered over the five foot five inch acting doppelganger. But in addition, Ralph, with his deep seriousness of purpose and deadpan wit, shared Richard Dreyfuss's uncanny ability simultaneously to plumb the depths of drama and comedy in films like Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. But my favorite Richard Dreyfuss film is the one that reminds me the most of Ralph. And that's Stand By Me. In it, as most of you will recall, Richard, Richard Dreyfuss plays the grown up Gordy who narrates the story of four 12 year old boys whose journey to find a dead body leads them to discover a depth of character and emotion in each other and even more in themselves that they never knew existed and that they rarely found again. In the last line of the movie, the grown up Gordy writes, I never had any friends later on like the ones I had when I was 12. Jesus, does anyone? I was 22 when I met Ralph in the fall of 1978. But rarely have I had a more generous and caring friend. Ralph was the most stand-up guy you could ever meet, offering support without ever being asked. So I'll close with this. Debbie, Michael, Rachel. In the words of the great Ben E. King, who whose song played as the credits rolled. Now that the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we see, please don't be afraid, don't be afraid. For I and every one of Ralph's legions of friends will always be there to stand by you as he always stood by us. And we promise that we will always stand up for all those who struggle for justice. Justice Ralph Dreyfus Gantz dedicated his life to uplift. Thank you. And now it is my great honor to turn the podium over to Susan Finnegan who has done so much already to preserve Ralph's legacy. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak about my dear friend and colleague, Chief Justice Ralph Gantz. I was so fortunate to partner with the chief so closely on access to justice initiatives over the past 10 years, having served with him first as a member of the Massachusetts Access to Justice Commission, and then as his co-chair for many years. My heart goes out to his family about whom he often spoke with love and pride at this difficult time. Well, there are many anecdotes I could tell you about his work on access to justice. I thought I'd share with you a few things I learned about him when he applied to become Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court in 2014, after having served as an Associate Justice for four years. As some of you may know, if you've ever applied to become a state judge in Massachusetts, one of the questions you are asked is, what are you most proud of professionally? And in answering that question, while he could have mentioned so many accomplishments in his decades long storied career as a trial lawyer and a trial and appellate judge, instead, the first thing he mentioned in his response and the achievement of which he was most proud was his work as co-chair of the Access to Justice Commission. He cared so deeply about this work that he ended up filling two pages of his application, proudly describing the various projects that he had worked on in collaboration with so many people during his first years on the commission. This emphasis on collaboration was in fact, one of his true hallmarks of his commission work. He encouraged people to work with him, then engage deeply in the work with us, applying his laser focus 
his warm sense of humor, and his astonishing work ethic to every project we embarked on. And during that time in his nomination for the chief position, he spoke several times about two lessons he learned from his parents early on that helped form the person he later became. The first life lesson was from his father. And as some of you may know, his father was a salesman who sold French and German wines to restaurants and liquor stores in New York. And as a salesman, his father was always mindful of the concept of continued performance. He would say, they don't care what you did last year, they care what you're going to do this year. And he took that advice to heart in the, all of the work that we did together. He was an energetic man of action in our state and nationally. On our state commission, commission, for the better part of a decade, he pushed us to be a working commission and transformed us into a more proactive and active organization. He loved holding commission retreats every summer at his house so that we could develop a strategic plan of action for the coming year. And he, while he pushed us in those meetings to think deeply with him about the important issues we faced, he also pushed us to leave the retreat with three or four actionable goals that we could achieve by year's end. He would often say to all of us that we need to do things, not just create reports to have them collect dust on shelves. And so when we did produce reports, they had to have a purpose. And he was a man of action too on the national stage as an active member and leader of the Conference of Chief Justices. He gently nudged other state courts to make justice more accessible for all. He did so by creating conference agendas to address such topics. And he also drafted various policy resolutions on such issues as access to justice and racial justice, and then used his political savvy to figure out the best way to ensure how to get their passage. The second life lesson that he shared was from his mother, explaining that his mother nudged, judged everyone by how they treated others. The highest praise she could give to a person of accomplishment was that he was a regular guy, as in that Jonas Salk invented the polio vaccine, but he was just a regular guy. And so while he could have stayed in her, his ornate office on the second floor of the Adams Courthouse and bask in his many accomplishments, he chose instead to focus on those in our community who did not have access to such privilege. He felt a great responsibility as chief justice and chief of the court system to try to understand what it was like for all those who walk through courthouse doors, particularly those who came to court with no attorney, with no facility with language, or with no access to technology. He was especially concerned about this court user experience during the last seven months during the pandemic, when access to court buildings was closed to most litigants and self-represented litigants had to figure out how to find and use remote court systems. And indeed, he became even more concerned during the last months of his life with the looming eviction crisis due to the pandemic and the resulting economic recession. He described this crisis as the greatest access to justice challenge of our lifetime. On the morning of his death, we spoke for half an hour about his deep concerns about this problem strategizing on solutions as we often would. I take some solace in the fact that he spent the last hours of his incredible life doing something he loved to do, using his gift of his intellect and the power of his, uh, and the privilege of his power as chief to help the many desperate people impacted by this pandemic. And I'll close with a nod to his mother, that Ralph Gantz was a brilliant jurist a national voice for access to justice, an indispensable leader, a beloved figure to so many, but also a great friend to those close to him, but most of all, a regular guy. It is my pleasure now to turn this over to, to Supreme Court, Supreme Judicial Court Associate Justice Kimberly Budd. Thank you so much, Sue. Hi all. I. Um... You've heard a lot about Ralph. Uh, he's meant so much to so many people. I'm very grateful to be able to tell you a little bit about Ralph as the chief of the SJC from my perspective as an associate justice. 
Ralph was a great chief justice. First, you know, it takes a lot to keep everything running at the SJC. There are a lot of moving parts. Certain things are scheduled to happen at the same time each month, and it takes every person to do their job and to do it well to make sure that that which is supposed to happen does happen. And it does. Thanks to Ralph, the culture at the court is collegial and professional in every one of our departments. The chief made sure that everyone working there knew that they and the work that they do for the court and the Commonwealth was appreciated. Some of you may remember that in 2016, there were three openings on the court uh, at one time. And I was one of the three new justices along with Frank Gaziano and David Lowy. We were sworn in uh, that fall and uh, Ralph had his hands full. It is said that one new justice changes the court. Just imagine what it was like to have three new justices start at the same time. Ralph found a way to make sure that each of us was onboarded and oriented, that we understood how things worked at the court and that we quickly made our way up a very steep learning curve. He did the same thing for Ellie Cipher and Scott Kafker, both of whom came a year later. He was invested in our success because he cared deeply about the SJC as an institution but also because he cared deeply about us as individuals. You heard he was smart and that's true, but he always gave credit where credit was due. And although he was chief, he always treated us as a team of equals. Ralph was responsible for making all manner of decisions that affected the judiciary and the entire Commonwealth. He consulted us but he was never afraid to make the difficult decisions that had to be made. One of the things that he was proud of, um, I think, was the fact that so many of our decisions, our opinions um, have been unanimous. Now, I should tell you that as a group of justices, we each have our own distinct personality. And when we talked about cases after oral argument, often, we would have six different ideas about how a case should turn out. During Sambal, after we each had a turn to say our piece, as chief, Ralph would speak last. There were times when he was able to weave together all of our ideas into a coherent whole that we could all agree upon. And then there were other times when his point of view was completely different from anything anyone else had said but after hearing it, everyone agreed that he was exactly right. Perhaps most importantly, we enjoyed each other's company. We spend a lot of time together uh, as justices and the fact that we as a group are so collegial is due in great measure to Ralph's leadership. He had a great sense of humor and as serious as the job is, he didn't take himself too seriously. And we had many light moments that we will never forget. Ralph was a great person to work with and to lead the court. He was a wonderful mentor and friend. I could call him with any issue and he would always have an answer for me. It's hard to believe that I won't be able to ask him all of the questions that I still have. I am, however, grateful for the time that I did have to get to know him, to work with him, and to learn from him. And I will miss him very much. I now want to present Professor Deborah Ramirez, Ralph's wonderful wife. All right, can people hear me? Yes.
Martha, I wanted to begin with you um, because I wanted to use my time to talk about how special all of you were in Ralph's life. He needed so many people to help him with all of the projects that he was doing. Martha, you were such an important person in his life. You worked tirelessly all your life to provide legal services to those who could not afford them. And he greatly admired that about you. When he needed a study to help him understand the ways in which racial inequity infected our system, he turned to you. He had no money and no funding for this study, but somehow you made it possible and helped him. And you provided him with a study that mapped out how racial inequities affected our system and caused racial disproportionality. He knew that you can't solve a problem if you don't know what it is. And so he will be forever grateful to you for helping him with that report. And when it came out, he was so proud. He said, I know this is not gonna be a study that sits on some shelf. Even after his heart attack, he went into his office the morning of his death and began to work on an action plan for how the court would respond to Harvard's report. Deval, you took a chance on him. You saw the chief he would someday become. You gave him the opportunity to become that chief. You made him your chief justice. And he was forever grateful for that. Every day, he tried to live up to your expectations. Margie, you were his rabbi, the person who navigated his path to becoming the chief. One day, you did walk into his office and you said, I'd like you to chair the Access to Justice Commission. And that moment changed his life. You helped him traverse the terrain to become the Chief Justice. And he was forever grateful to you for that. Rachel, you're right. You have a different style than Ralph. But we both were so proud of you. He knew what an important and powerful role a prosecutor plays in the criminal justice system. And he admired your style and your way of accomplishing change. He admired the way you redefined the job. Like him, you felt a part of your job was to make the entire system fairer and more just, especially for those who were marginalized. You identified problems. Like him, you tried to address them and you were a force and are a force for systemic changes. Both of us knew how important your work was and is. David, you did meet him long, long ago when he was on the law review with you. And I remember when we married, you and Anne-Marie took us out for a special dinner in Cambridge to celebrate our marriage. I know that you and he had begun a special collaboration about the future of the courts. And he was so excited by your energy and by that enterprise. But long before that, you were always a trusted and beloved friend of our family, to our children, to me, and to Ralph. And we thank you for that. Your presence in our lives has greatly enriched all of us. Sue, you were his partner in all things access to justice. 
he could not have done all that he did without you by his side. I once asked him the secret to the success of the Access to Justice Commission. And he said two words, Sue Finnegan. He said, the real secret is this, here's how it works. She tells me what to do. And I say, okay, let's do that. He was so proud of all that the two of you accomplished. Kim, you were his fellow justice, his friend, his colleague. He treasured your wisdom, advice, and assistance, and he was proud of your leadership on racial justice issues and thrilled to have you on the court. Harvard was such an important part of his life. He would have been so pleased by today's program. Thank you, Dean Manning, Martha Minow, and the others who made all of this possible. I add my thanks to everyone who participated and everyone who has been here as we honor Chief Justice Ralph D. Gantz, Ralph Dreyfus Gantz, Mensch, proactive with laser focus, someone who knew how to stand by and stand up, be a drum major for justice, be a social justice justice and a regular guy, have an action plan and act, treat every person we encounter as someone of dignity and worth. We leave our time together today with resolve, with gratitude to Debbie and her family for allowing us to honor our friend and hero. And we leave with resolve to add to the work, to redress injustice, to advance justice. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>